Greetings, my friends. Today, we are going to start a book by Natalie Babbitt called Tuck Everlasting. Please follow along as you read. As I read, you follow along in the book with me. Also, if you wouldn't mind, please like and subscribe. And if you need to get a hold of me in any way, my email is Ms. Tutor, M I Z T U T O R, at gmail.com. I welcome all your questions and let's get with the story. Tuck Everlasting Prologue The first week of August hangs at the very top of summer, the top of the live long year, like the highest seat of a Ferris wheel when it pauses in its turning. The weeks that come before are only a climb from balmy spring and those that follow a drop to the chill of autumn. But the first week of August is motionless and hot. It is curiously silent too with blank white dawns and glaring noons and sunsets smeared with too much color. Often at night there is lightning, but it quivers all alone. There is no thunder, no relieving rain. These are strange and breathless days, the dog days, when people are led to do things they are sure to be sorry for after. One day at that time, not so very long ago, three things happened. And at first there appeared to be no connection between them. At dawn, May Tuck set out on her horse for the wood at the edge of the village of Tree Gap. She was going there as she did every once, every ten years, to meet her two sons, Miles and Jesse. At noontime, Winnie Foster, whose family owned the Tree Gap wood, lost her patience at last and decided to think about running away. And at sunset, a stranger appeared at the foster's gate. He was looking for someone, but he didn't say who. No connection, you would agree, but things can come together in strange ways. The wood was at the center of the hub of the wheel. All wheels must have a hub. Ferris wheel, a Ferris wheel has one as the sun is the hub of the wheeling calendar. Fixed points they are, and best left undisturbed, for without them, nothing holds together. But sometimes, people find this out too late. Chapter One The road that led to True Gap had been trod out long before by a herd of cows who were, to say the least, relaxed. It wandered along in curves and easy angles, swayed off and up in a pleasant tangent to the top of a small hill, ambled down again between fringes of bee-hung clover, and then cut sideways across a meadow. Here, its edges blurred. It widened and seemed to pause, suggesting tranquil bovine picnics, slow chewing and thoughtful contemplation of the infinite, and then, and went on again and came at last to the wood. But on reaching the shadows of the first trees, it veered sharply, swung out in a wide arc, as if for the first time it had reason to think where it was going, and passed around. On the other side of the wood, the sense of easiness dissolved. The road no longer belonged to the cows. It became instead, and rather abruptly, the property of people. Uh, and all at once the sun was uncomfortably hot, the dust oppressive and the meager grass along its edges somewhat ragged and forlorn. On the left stood the first house, a square and solid cottage with a touch-me-not appearance, surrounded by grass cut painfully to the quick and enclosed by a capable iron fence some four feet high which clearly said Move on, we don't want you here. So the road went humbly by and made its way, 
past cottages more and more frequent, but less and less forbidding into the village. But the village doesn't matter, except for the jailhouse and the gallows. The first house only is important. The first house, the road, and the wood. There was something strange about the wood. If the look of the first house suggested that you'd better pass it by, so did the look of the wood. But for quite a different reason. The house was so proud of itself that you wanted to make a lot of noise as you passed and maybe even throw a rock or two. But the wood had a sleeping, other world appearance that made you want to speak in whispers. This, at least, is what the cows must have thought. Let it keep its peace. We won't disturb it. Whether the people felt that way about the wood or not is difficult to say. There were some, perhaps, who did. But for the most part, the people followed the road around the wood because that was the way it led. There was no road through the wood. And anyway, for the people, there was another reason to leave the wood to itself. It belonged to the Fosters, the owners of the Touch-Me-Not Cottage, and was therefore private property in spite of the fact that it lay outside the fence and was perfectly accessible. The ownership of the land, the ownership of land is an odd thing when you come to think of it. How deep after all can it go? If a person owns a piece of land, does he own it all the way down in ever narrowing dimensions till it meets all other pieces at the center of the earth? Or does ownership consist only of a thin crust under which the friendly worms have never heard of trespassing? In any case, the wood, being on top, except of course for its roots, was owned bud and bough by the Fosters in the Touch Me Not Cottage. And if they never went there, if they never wandered in among the trees, well, that was their affair. Winnie, the only child of the house, never went there, though she sometimes stood inside the fence, carelessly banging a stick against the iron bars and looked at it. But she'd never been curious about it. Nothing ever seems interesting when it belongs to you, only when it doesn't. And what is interesting anyway about a slim few acres of trees? There will be a dimness shot through with bars of sunlight, a great many squirrels and birds, a deep, damp mattress of leaves on the ground, and all the other things just as familiar, if not so pleasant. Things like spiders, thorns, and grubs. In the end, however, it was the cows who were responsible for the wood's isolation, and the cows through some wisdom they were not wise enough to know that they possessed, were very wise indeed. If they had made their road through the wood instead of around it, then the people would have followed the road. The people would have noticed the giant ash tree at the center of the wood, and then, in time, They'd have noticed the little spring bubbling up among its roots in spite of the pebbles piled there to conceal it. And that would have been a disaster so immense that this weary old earth, owned or not to its fiery core, would have trembled on its axis like a beetle on a pen. Chapter 2 and so at dawn, that day in the first week of August, May Tuck woke up and lay for a while, beaming at the cobwebs on the ceiling. At last she said aloud, The boys will be home tomorrow. May's husband on his back beside her did not stir. He was still asleep, and the melancholy creases that folded his daytime face were smoothed and slack. He snored gently, and for a moment, the corners of his mouth turned upward in a smile. Tuck almost never smiled, except in sleep. May sat up in bed and looked at him tolerantly. 
The boys will be home tomorrow, she said again, a little more loudly. Tuck twitched and the smile vanished. He opened his eyes. Why'd you have to wake me up, he sighed. I was having that dream again, the good one, where we're all in heaven and never heard of Tree Gap. May sat there frowning, a great potato of a woman with a round, sensible face and calm brown eyes. It's no use having that dream, she said. Nothing's going to change. You tell me that every day, said Tuck, turning away from her onto his side. Anyways, I can't help what I dream. Maybe not, said May. But all the same, you should have got used to things by now. Tuck groaned. I'm going back to sleep, he said. Not me, said May. I'm going to take the horse and go down to the wood to meet them. Meet who? The boys, Tuck, our sons. I'm going to ride down to meet them. Better not do that, said Tuck. I know, said May, but I just can't wait to see them. Anyways, it's ten years since I went to Jury Gap. No one will remember me. I ride in at sunset just to the wood. I won't go into the village. But even if someone did see me, they won't remember. They never did before now, did they? Suit yourself then, said Tuck into his pillow. I'm going back to sleep. May Tuck climbed out of bed and began to dress. Three petticoats, a rusty brown skirt with one enormous pocket, an old cotton jacket, and a knitted shawl, which she pinned across her bosom with a tarnished metal brooch. The sound of her dressing were so familiar. The sounds of her dressing were so familiar to Tuck that he could say, without opening his eyes, you don't need that shawl in the middle of the summer. May ignored this observation. Instead, she said, Will you be all right? We won't get back until late tomorrow. Tuck rolled over and made a rueful face at her. What in the world could possibly happen to me? Oh, that's so. I keep forgetting, said May. I don't, said Tuck. Have a nice time. And in a moment, he was asleep again. May sat on the edge of the bed and pulled on a pair of short leather boots, so thin and soft with age, it was a wonder they held together. Then she stood and took from the washstand beside the bed a little square-shaped object, a music box, painted with roses and lilies of the valley. It was the pretty, the one pretty thing she owned, and she never went anywhere without it. Her fingers strayed to the winding key on its bottom, but glancing at the sleeping tuck, she shook her head, gave the little box a pat, and dropped it into her pocket. Then, last of all, she pulled down over her ears a blue straw hat with a drooping, exhausted brim. But before she put on the hat, she brushed her gray-brown hair and wound it into a bun at the back of her neck. She did this quickly and skillfully without a single glance in the mirror. May Tuck didn't need a mirror, though she had one propped up on the washstand. She knew very well what she would see in it. Her reflection had long since, since ceased to interest her. For May Tuck and her husband, and Miles and Jessie too, had all looked exactly the same for 80 seven years. Chapter 3 At noon of the same day in the first week of August, Winnie Foster sat on the bristly grass just inside the fence and said to the huge large toad who was squatting a few yards away across the road, I will though. You'll see. Maybe even first thing tomorrow while everyone's still asleep. It was hard to know whether the toad was listening or not. Certainly Winnie had given it good reason to ignore her. She had come out to the fence very cross, very near the boiling point on a day that was itself near to boiling, and had noticed the toad at once. It was the only living thing in sight except for a stationary cloud 
of hysterical gnats suspended in the heat above the road. Winnie had found some pebbles at the base of the fence and, for lack of any other way to show how she felt, had flung one at the road, at the toad, excuse me, at the toad. It missed altogether, as she'd finally, in, as she'd fully intended it should. But she made a game of it anyway, tossing pebbles at such an angle that they passed through the gnat cloud on their way to the toad. The gnats were too frantic to notice these intrusions, however, and since every pebble missed its final mark, the toad continued to swat, squat and grimace without so much as a twitch. Possibly it felt resentful. Or perhaps it was only asleep. In either case, it gave her not a glance when at last she ran out of pebbles and sat down to tell it her troubles. Look here, Toad, she said, thrusting her arms through the bars of the fence and plucking at the weeds on the other side. I don't think I can stand it much longer. At this moment, a window at the front of the cottage was flung open and a thin voice, her grandmother's, piped. Winifred! Don't sit on that dirty grass. You'll stain your boots and stockings. And another firmer voice, her mother's added, Come in now, Winnie, right away. You'll get heat stroke out there on a day like this, and your lunch is ready. See, said Winnie to the toad, that's just what I mean. It's not like that every minute. If I had a sister or a brother, there'd be someone else for them to watch. But as it is, there's only me. I'm tired of being looked at all the time. I want to be by myself for a change. She leaned her forehead against the bars and after a short silence went on in a thoughtful tone. I'm not exactly sure what I do, you know. It's something interesting, something that's all mine, something that would make some kind of difference in the world. It'd be nice to have a new name to start with. Pat, one that's not all worn out from being called so much. And I might even decide to have a pet. Maybe a big old toad like you that I could keep in a nice cage with lots of grass and... At this, the toad stirred and blinked. It gave a heave of muscles and plopped its heavy mud ball of a body a few inches farther away from her. I suppose you're right, said Winnie. Then you'd be just the way I am now. Why should you have to be cooped up in a cage too? It'd be better if I could be like you, out in the open and making up my own mind. Do you know they've hardly ever let me out of this yard all by myself? I'll never be able to do anything important if I stay in here like this. I expect I'd better run away. She paused and peered anxiously at the toad to see how it would receive this staggering idea. But it showed no signs of interest. You think I wouldn't dare, don't you? She said accusingly. I will, though. You'll see. Maybe even first thing in the morning while everyone's still asleep. Winnie, came the firm voice from the window. All right, I'm coming, she cried, exasperated, and then added quickly, I mean, I'll be right there, Mama. She stood up, brushing at her legs where bits of itchy grass clung to her stockings. The toad, as if it saw that their interview was over, stirred again, bunched up and bounced itself clumsily off toward the wood. Winnie watched it go. Hop away, Toad, she cried, called after it. You'll see. Just wait till morning. Chapter 4 At sunset of the same long day, a stranger came strolling up the road from the village and paused at the foster's gate. Winnie was again... W w uh, Winnie was once again in the yard, this time intent on catching fireflies, and at first she didn't notice him. But after a few moments of watching her, he called out, Good evening. He was remarkably tall and narrow, the stranger standing there, 
His long chin faded off to a thin, apologetic beard, but his suit was a jaunty yellow that seemed to glow a little in the fading light. A black hat dangled from one hand, and as Winnie came toward him, he passed the other through his dry gray hair, settling it smoothly. Well now, he said in a light voice, out for fireflies, are you? Yes, said Winnie. A lovely thing to do on a summer evening, said the man richly. A lovely entertainment. I used to do it myself when I was your age. But of course, that was a long ago, a long, long time ago. He laughed, gesturing in self-deprecation with long, thin fingers. His tall body moved continuously. A foot tapped, a shoulder twitched, and it moved in angles rather jerkily. But at the same time, he had a kind of grace, like a well-handled marionette. Indeed, he seemed almost to hang suspended there in the twilight. But Winnie, though she was half charmed, was suddenly reminded of the th stiff black ribbons they had hung on the door of the cottage for her grandfather's funeral. She frowned and looked at the man more closely, but his smile seemed perfectly all right, quite agreeable and friendly. Is this your house? asked the man, folding his arms now and leaning against the gate. Yes, said Winnie. Do you want to see my father? Perhaps, in a bit, said the man, but I'd like to talk to you first. Have you and your family lived here long? Oh, yes, said Winnie. We've lived here forever. Forever, the man echoed thoughtfully. It was not a question, but Winnie decided to explain it anyway. Well, not forever, of course, but as long as there have been any people here, my grandmother was born here. She says this was all trees once, just one big forest everywhere around, but it's mostly all cut down now, except for the wood. I see, said the man pulling at his beard. So of course you know everyone and everything that goes on. Well, not especially, said Winnie. At least I don't. Why? The man lifted his eyebrows. Oh, he said. I'm looking for someone, a family. I don't know anybody much, said Winnie with a shrug, but my fa father might, you could ask him. I believe I shall, said the man. I do believe I shall. At this moment, the cottage door opened and in the lamp glow that spilled across the grass, Winnie's grandmother appeared. Winifred, who are you talking to out there? It's a man, Granny, she called back. He says he's looking for someone. What's that? said the old woman. She picked up her skirts and came down the path to the gate. What did you say he wants? The man on the other side of the fence bowed slightly. Good evening, madam, he said. How delightful to see you looking so fit. And why shouldn't I be fit? She retorted, peering at him through the fading light. His yellow suit seemed to surprise her, and she squinted suspiciously. We haven't met that I can recall. Who are you? Who are you looking for? The man answered neither of these questions. Instead, he said, This young lady tells me you've lived here for a long time, so I thought you would probably know everyone who comes and goes. The old woman shook her head. I don't know everyone, she said, nor do I want to. And I don't stand outside in the dark discussing such things with strangers. Neither does Winifred so. And then she paused, for through the twilight sounds of crickets and sighing trees, a faint su surprising wisp of music came floating to them, and all three turned toward it, toward the wood. It was a tinkling little melody, and in a few moments it stopped. My stars, said Winnie's grandmother, her eyes round. I do believe it's come again after all these years. She pressed her wrinkled hands together, forgetting the man in the yellow suit. Did you hear that, Winifred? That's it. That's the elf music I told you about. Why, it's been ages since I heard it last. And this is the first time you've ever heard it, isn't it? 
Wait till we tell your father. And she seized Winnie's hands and turned to go back into the cottage. Wait, said the man at the gate. He had stiffened and his voice was eager. You've heard that music before, you say. But before he could get an answer, it began again and they all stopped to listen. This time, it tinkled its way faintly through the little melody three times before it faded. It sounds like a music box, said Winnie when it was over. Nonsense, it's elves, crowed her grandmother excitedly. And then she said to the man at the gate, you'll have to excuse us now. She shook the gate latch under his nose to make sure it was locked. And then taking Winnie by the hand once more, she marched up to the path, up the path into the cottage, shutting the door firmly behind her. But the man in the yellow suit stood tapping his foot in the road for a long time all alone, looking at the wood. The last strains of sunset had melted away and the twilight died too as he stood there, though its remnants clung reluctantly to everything that was pale in color, pebbles, the dusty road, the figure of the man himself, turning them blue and blurry. Then the moon rose. The man came to himself and sighed. His expression was one of intense satisfaction. He put on his hat, and in the moonlight his long fingers were graceful and very white. Then he turned and disappeared down the shadowy road, and as he went he whistled very softly the tinkling little melody from the wood. Chapter 5 when he woke early next morning, the sun was only just opening its own eye on the eastern horizon and the cottage was full of silence. But she realized that sometime during the night she had made up her mind. She would not run away today. Where would I go anyway? She asked herself. There's nowhere else I really want to be. But in another part of her head, the dark part where her oldest fears were housed, she knew there was another sort of reason for staying at home. She was afraid to go away alone. It was one thing to talk about being by yourself, doing important things, but quite another when the opportunity arose. The characters in the stories she read always seemed to go off without a thought or care. But in real life, well, the world was a dangerous place. People were always telling her so, and she would not be able to manage without protection. They were always telling her that, too. No one ever said precisely what it was that she would not need be able to manage, but she did not need to ask. Her own imagination supplied the horrors. Still, it was galling, this having to admit she was afraid, and when she remembered the toad, she felt even more disheartened. What if the toad should be out by the fence again today? What if he should laugh at her secretly and think she was a coward? Well, anyway, she could at least slip out right now, she decided, and go into the wood to see if she could discover what had made really made the music the night before. That would be something anyway. She did not allow herself to consider the idea that making a difference in the world might Require a bolder adventure. She merely told herself consolingly, Of course, while I'm out in the wood, while I'm in the wood, if I decide never to come back, well, then that will be that. She was able to believe in this because she needed to, and believing was her own true promising friend once more. It was another heavy morning, already hot and breathless, but in the wood the air was cooler and smelled agreeably damp. Winnie had been no more than two slow minutes walking timidly under the interlacing branches when she wondered why she had never come here before. Why, it's nice, she thought with a great surprise, for the wood was full of light, entirely different from the light she was used to. It was green and amber and alive, quivering in splotches on the padded ground, fanning into sturdy stripes between the tree trunks. There were little flowers she did not recognize, 
white and palest blue and endless tangled vines, and here and there a fallen log, half rotted but soft, with patches of sweet green velvet moss. And there were creatures everywhere. The air fairly hummed with their daybreak activities, beetles and birds and squirrels and ants and countless other things unseen, all gentle and self-absorbed and not in the least alarming. There was even, she saw with satisfaction, the toad. It was squatting on a low stump and she might not have noticed it for it looked more like a mushroom than a living creature sitting there. As she came abreast of it, however, it blinked and the movement gave it away. See, she exclaimed, I told you I'd be here first thing in the morning. The toad blinked again and nodded. Or perhaps it was only swallowing a fly. But then it nudged itself off the edge of the stump and vanished in the underbrush. It must have been watching for me, said Winnie to herself, and was very glad she had come. She wandered for a long time, looking at everything, listening to everything, proud to forget the tight, pruned world outside, humming a little now, trying to remember the pattern of the melody she had heard the night before. And then, up ahead, in a place where the light seemed brighter and the ground somewhat more open, something moved. Winnie stopped abruptly and crouched down. It's really elves, she thought. I can have a look at them. And though her instinct was to turn and run, she was pleased to discover that her curiosity was stronger. She began to creep forward. She would go just close enough, she told herself, just close enough to see. And then she would turn and run. But when she came near, up behind a sheltering tree trunk and peered around it, her mouth dropped open and all thought of running melted away. There was a clearing directly in front of her, at the center of which an enormous tree thrust up its thick roots, rumpling the ground ten feet around in every direction. Sitting relaxed, with his back against the trunk, was a boy, almost a man and he seemed so glorious to Winnie that she lost her heart at once. He was thin and sunburned, this wonderful boy, with a thick mop of curly brown hair, and he wore his battered trousers and loose, grubby shirt with as much self-assurance as if they were silk and satin. A pair of green suspenders, more decorative than useful, gave the finishing touch, for he was shoeless and there was a twig tucked between the toes of one foot. He waved the twig idly as he sat there, his face turned up to gaze at the branches far above him. The golden morning light seemed to glow all around him, while brighter patches fell now on his lean brown hands, now on his hair and face, as the leaves stirred over his head. Then he rubbed an ear carelessly, yawned and stretched. Shifting his position, he turned his attention to a little pile of pebbles next to him. As Winnie watched, scarcely breathing, he moved the pile carefully to one side, pebble by pebble. Beneath the pile, the ground was shiny wet. The boy lifted a final stone, and Winnie saw a low spurt of water arching up and returning like a fountain into the ground. He bent and put his lips to the spurt, drinking noiselessly, and then sat up again and drew his shirt sleeve across his mouth. As he did this, he turned his face in her direction, and their eyes met. For a long moment, they looked at each other in silence. The boy, with his arm still raised to his mouth, neither of them moved. At last, his arm fell to his side. You may well, may as well come out, he said with a frown. Winnie stood up, embarrassed, and because of that, resentful. I didn't mean to watch you, she protested as she stepped in the clearing. I didn't know anyone would be here. 
The boy eyed her as she came forward. What are you? What are you doing here? He asked her sternly. It's my wood, said Winnie, surprised by the question. I can come here whenever I want to. At least I was never here before, but I could have come any time. Oh, said the boy, relaxing a little. You're one of the Fosters, then. I'm Winnie, she said. Who are you? I'm Jessie Tuck, he answered. How do? And he put, his, put out his hand. Winnie took his hand, staring at him. He was even more beautiful up close. Do you live nearby, she managed at last, letting go of his hand reluctantly. I never saw you before. Do you come here a lot? No one's supposed to. It's our wood, she added quickly. It's all right, though, if you come here. I mean, it's all right with me. The boy grinned. No, I don't live nearby. And no, I don't come here often. Just passing through. And thanks. I'm glad it's all right with you. That's good, said Winnie irreverently. She stepped back and sat down primly a short distance from him. How old are you anyway? she asked, squinting at him. There was a pause. At last he said, Why do you want to know? I just wondered, said Winnie. All right. I'm 104 years old, he told her solemnly. No, I mean really, she persisted. Well then, if you must know, I'm 17. 17? That's right. Oh, said Winnie hopelessly. Seventeen, that's old. You have no idea, he agreed with a nod. Winnie had the feeling he was laughing at her, but decided it was a kind of, a nice kind of laughing. Are you married? She asked next. This time he laughed out loud. Ha! No, I'm not married, are you? Now it was Winnie's turn to laugh. Of course not, she said. I'm only ten. But I'll be eleven pretty soon. And then you'll get married, he suggested. Winnie laughed again, her head on one side admiring him. And then she pointed to the spurt of water. Is that good to drink, she asked. I'm thirsty. Jessie Tuck's face was instantly serious. No, oh, that, no, 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 it's not, he said quickly. You mustn't drink from it. Come right up a, out of the ground probably pretty dirty and he began to pile the pebbles over it again but you drank some when he reminded him oh did you see that he looked at her anxiously well me i'll drink anything i mean i'm used to it 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 wouldn't be good for you though why not said winnie she stood up it's mine anyway if it's in the wood i want some I'm about as dry as dust, and she went to where she, he sat and knelt down beside the pile of pebbles. Believe me, Winnie Foster, said Jessie, it would be terrible for you if you drank any of this water. Just terrible. I can't let you. Well, I don't, I still don't see why not, said Winnie plaintively. I'm getting thirstier every minute. If it didn't hurt you, it won't hurt me. If my papa was here, he'd let me have some. You're not going to tell him about it, are you? said Jessie. His face had gone very pale under its sunburn. He stood up and put a bare foot firmly on the pile of pebbles. I knew this would happen sooner or later. Later, now what am I going to do? As he said this, there was a crashing sound among the trees and a voice called, Jessie! Thank goodness, said Jesse, blowing in, out his cheeks in relief. Here comes Miles and Ma and Miles. They'll know what to do. And sure enough, a big comfortable looking woman appeared, leading a fat old horse, and at her side was a young man almost as beautiful as Jesse. It was May Tuck with her other son, Jesse's older brother. And at once, when she saw the two of them, Jesse with his foot on the pile of pebbles, and Winnie on her knees beside him, she seemed to understand. Her hand flew to her bosom, grasping at the old brooch that fastened her shawl, and her face went bleak. 
Well, boys, she said, here it is. The worst is happening at last. And that is the end of this first reading of Tuck Everlasting. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace.